not too far from where the PEI Dimetrodon fossil first appeared, and for more than a decade, Bart Bournes operated PEI's closest equivalent to a dinosaur museum. I'm interested in life, and there's a whole pile of subjects that I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about and trying to figure out how it was. There, I, I love ancient history. Uh, we ran the science park. Uh, we built the first science center in PEI. It's, it's on the same property as where we have the dinosaur museum. And uh, we decided we would throw in something on dinosaurs because it was basically the kids were very interested in the park and kids are interested in dinosaurs. So we started with a small uh, one little building with a number of skulls and some fossils. And then we decided to expand uh, into this facility here. Uh, the people love it. Uh, we still don't get huge numbers, but the people who come, it's kind of one of these little gems that you find by accident. We, we do something that most museums don't do, and uh, we throw in humor in a lot of cases. Bart's collection of fossils and replicas is impressive. Everything from early human ancestors to the mighty Dimetrodon itself. But it's privately owned. What's the provincial government doing to bring fossils to a wider public? Finding the answers meant diving into the murky waters of provincial politics. PEI doesn't have a central museum facility, but it does have a Museum and Heritage Foundation headquartered in Charlottetown's elegant Beaconsfield Historic House. In 2014, its executive director, Dr. David Keenly Side, oversaw a thorough cataloging of the province's natural science specimens, including fossils, an important step on the road toward a provincial museum. A strong part of what we do is educational, is um, knowledge building and, and learning about uh, um, our environment and our past and, and our history and so on. And I see museums as really just an extension of the schoolroom um, as a learning, another learning venue. The idea of a central museum where you would sort of more or less have a one-stop shopping kind of concept is something that uh, uh, the museum uh, is not there yet. Uh, we've certainly been trying to get one now for uh, many years. Um, we've certainly made um, a lot of progress in terms of identifying and recording and uh, um, sort of establishing a base for history, prehistory, the um, paleontological record. I think we framed it well. I think it's just a question now of um, seeing one, what kind of facility that we would uh, have. I expect it would be here in Charlottetown. But it would be a, um, uh, obviously, an, a, the important step would be to convince government that um, this be funded, uh, not only built, uh, but funded on a long-term basis. The Natural History Society of PEI, which meets here every month, recently lobbied government for a central museum to no avail. Their president, retired wildlife biologist Rosemary Curley, helped compile the provincial specimen catalog. How close are we to having a, a central museum here now? I, I think it's a long ways off. I don't think it's really about the money uh, because I think there is money available. There's, a, there's really no empathy for it uh, in government. That's what I see. To get a museum, the public will have to demand it. And uh, also I think the public needs to organize, but you know, this is not their there just doesn't seem to be a leader there to take over to do the whole thing about getting a museum. So um, definitely they should be telling their politicians that we do need a central museum. The society's past president, Ian Scott, agrees. I think it's, uh, we have a system in Prince Edward Island in which we are very uh, close, often on the first name basis with uh, our, uh, our politicians and uh, that ability um, to uh, uh, when one sees a politician at a, a levee or at a strawberry uh, social in the summer, uh, that uh, saying, when are we going to see our provincial museum, is, uh, is a pertinent question. And uh, I, uh, 
I've uh, I've harped on it for a few uh, few years, and I'll continue to harp on it as long as I can. But it's uh, it's a, an issue that that uh, we all need to uh, to get involved with. Former Island NDP leader Mike Redmond shares his views on the matter. I think as time goes on, it kind of slip, this slips uh, on the back front of uh, priorities with government because there is a lot of things obviously that take up government's responsibility, education and health, but. This is a part of education. This is a part of educating our youth and uh, our young people about the history of Prince Edward Island. And uh, that's a missed opportunity if we don't uh, take advantage of all of the hard work and the, and the diligence that has been done by historians. If the province gets a central museum facility, then the public will finally see all the treasures that have been stored away for years in warehouses like this one, known as the Artifactory. Better still, the PEI Dimetrodon could come home, at least for a little while, as Dr. Ted Dashler explains. When you build a museum in PEI focused in on the history of life, the history of the earth, etc., it's only natural that, that the original material of, of Dimetrodon Borealis should go there. You know, long-term loan, short-term exhibit, whatever we work out, but it would be a great homecoming for sure. The PEI Museum and Heritage Foundation is overseen by the Minister of Education, Early Learning and Culture, the Honorable Jordan Brown. I figured if anyone could tell me when we might see a central museum building here, then he could. These are the phone and email records that show my 10 attempts to reach Minister Jordan Brown between November 2017 and June 2018. I visited the government offices in downtown Charlottetown hoping to meet with him as well. I basically wanted to interview him to get his department's plans for a central museum for PEI. I never did hear back from him. I did eventually hear back from his senior communications officer who sent me this email. It says, There is no active plan to build a provincial museum. If prospects for an island museum seem dim, then there's always the hope that interested groups and individuals could turn it around. One politician who's been very vocal about the need for a central museum is Peter Bevan Baker, MLA and leader of the Provincial Green Party. I'd like to think that the history of Prince Edward Island extends beyond just that single week in September 1864, an important week though that was, where Prince Edward Island played a, a, an absolutely crucial role in, in the birth of this country, Canada. Uh, but we have so much more. Our story extends so much further than that. Uh, I spoke, I did an interview outside Founders Hall. I think the location was great, the structure of the building. But sometimes I've learned in government, you, you, asking for something once very rarely will get the, the result you want. Often you have to keep poking and poking and poking. And, and uh, as Hannah, my caucus mate, says, uh, gentle pressure relentlessly applied is how you get things done. Peter's no stranger to fossil collecting. He spent his childhood digging up ancient sea creatures like these. Well, I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland, and one of, one of the, my great delights uh, was to go off uh, on a hike, and, uh, and I lived only a 10-minute cycle ride from a beautiful fossil bed where you could, uh, ammonites were, were the most common ones, but the most exciting ones were trilobites. And, and I, I remember gleefully uh, heading out with my little hammer and, and my, uh, my chisel and, and cracking away at the slate, it was, uh, and, and finding some really fascinating stuff. This slab of ammonite stands in the living room of Linda Nobles. Her collection represents one possible future for fossils on PEI, the private museum. My name is Linda Nobles. I'm an owner of Belfast Mini Mills, which is one of my passions, but my other passion is fossils and dinosaurs. One of my rooms in my house is dedicated to all my collection of fossils. I've had it properly set up for about three years. I go down to South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, and uh, out on 30,000 acre ranches down there with paleontologists. and. Uh, in the blazing hot sun, we dig for dinosaurs. Well, I had all my collection in boxes, so I decided, well, I got a chance to buy two amazing display cases from the island, uh, from an old mercantile store, and uh, I was able to, to showcase what I found. Well, the big piece is a Triceratops nose horn that I found in South Dakota this last year. 
we were digging on a 30,000 acre ranch and uh, came down a cliff and this was sticking up out of the ground. The smaller piece is a very unusual piece. It's a, one of either a brow horn or a nose horn off of a baby triceratops. Anybody that w wants to come and see my collection, I'm more than happy to show them. There's no point in collecting if you can't share what you've got with everybody and get everybody else excited about what's out there and, and what happened millions of years ago. I think if you're out on these digs just to find something for, because it's valuable, you're out there for the wrong reason. But if you're out there because you have a passion for it, it doesn't matter if you don't find stuff for days. One day you're going to find something and it's going to be amazing. Like a prehistoric crocodile. Or a T-Rex. <laughs> so what should I do if I find a fossil in the wild, so to speak? PEI's Director of Aboriginal Affairs and Archaeology, Dr. Helen Christmanson, offers a few suggestions. Removing an object from its original location uh, unfortunately also takes it out of its context and, and, and by removing it from its original location uh, you lose quite a, quite a bit of potential information about that object. However, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's best if you are out on a beach walk to pick it up uh, if you can, uh, otherwise it may get, we may never find it again. We would encourage people to uh, bring it to our attention. Uh, now, archaeology and paleontology are housed in the Aboriginal Affairs Secretariat with the provincial government. So, uh, we would we would encourage people to bring it to our attention, and we can we can identify the object for them. Or if it's if it's something that we'd like to consult with other professionals on, we can put them in direct contact with with other people that may help identify it for them. Another option is for them to take it to uh, the PEI Museum and Heritage Foundation and there are professionals there who can also help them identify objects. So we, so we would encourage them to bring it to us. Charlottetown sculptor Chris Ruprecht collects prehistoric life of a different sort. Put simply, he makes dinosaurs. Uh, I started sculpting dinosaurs only uh, a few years ago. I've been making sculptures of, of various things for uh, over the past five years. Uh, dinosaurs appeal to me because uh, it, it's something that, that's always changing. Uh, I look at you know, current day animals for reference. Of course, obvious ones like reptiles and, and all alligators and crocodiles, but then you look at uh, chickens you look at you know their bone structure and even like the scales on on their feet it it's very dinosaur like the little dinosaur in the display case inside what is that uh that's a little uh concept i did of, of a younger uh raptor um that design was based off of uh, the jurassic park um design for for the raptors and i kind of Combine some elements from uh, the second film with the with the third film, um, and came up with with that concept. Um, the one behind us is 27 and a half feet long, and it will stand 12 feet tall. My my studio that we're in, I designed it to house the uh, dimensions of of the T-Rex. On my Instagram, I have over 4,000 followers. Some of the followers are the special effects artists. My work isn't on display, but if anyone wants to contact me directly, I am setting up a display in my studio and, and my residence if anyone wishes to, to see my work. In my collection, I have a fossil seed fern from Wallace River, Nova Scotia. It's around 300 million years old. My cousin gave it to me just before I moved to PEI. It's a reminder of my youth, a time now fading quickly into the past. If a land can think and feel, then perhaps the island also carries its fossils as reminders, remnants of its role in the prehistoric world, waiting to be found and appreciated by all. Of course, my fellow Nova Scotian Dr. John Calder 
says it much better than I. The fossil record of Prince Edward Island is one of the most under appreciated and yet to be discovered fossil sites anywhere on this planet. The discoveries that are made here are very important and with there, there's opportunity here for paleontologists and young people who want to become a paleontologist to, uh, to contribute to our knowledge of ancient PEI and of the world of Pangaea because after all we were right in, that heart, in the heart of that world.